There was a time when car manufacturers used to let external performance tuners in on sort of like secret models that they were developing so that they could go and develop their own versions of that. Take Alpina for instance, that once independent purveyor of BM, fast BMWs, they used to get let in on what BMW are developing so that they could carry on developing their own alternatives to BMW's M products. Polestar, well, way back when, long before it became an electric car company, was actually a en performance engineering company that used to turn safe and sturdy Volvos into touring car monsters. But perhaps the biggest of them all was AMG. AMG was formed back in 1967 by two ex-Mercedes-Benz engineers, and their brief was simple. They were going to offer Mercedes-Benz customers more powerful, harder-edged engines to make the three-pointed star go a little bit quicker. But it soon became clear to them that customers wanted a little bit more than that, some tailored, kind of customised packages. And so that's what they started doing. And such was the success of this that in 1990, Mercedes-Benz signed an agreement with AMG to allow them to come within the Mercedes-Benz showrooms to offer their wares to more customers. That success continued to the point that by the end of that decade, Mercedes-Benz took a controlling stake in AMG and made it part of the Mercedes-Benz company. Now this has happened with others, of course, we've seen Polestar is now a completely different company because it was bought by Volvo and then obviously by Geely and is now a completely different company to what it first started doing. And Alpina? Well that's now wholly owned by BMW as well. But perhaps it's AMG that's going to have the most difficult task of all as we move towards electrification because of course they built their reputation on the internal combustion engine. So how are they going to cope in the future? Welcome to this week's road test review, welcome to the new Mercedes-Benz EQS AMG 53 and as always, welcome to Auto EV. <laughs> Now, before we get started on this week's road test review of the Mercedes-Benz EQS AMG 53, please make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Then once you've done that, make sure you press the little bell button that's down below, because then that way you'll be notified when our next video is uploaded and goes live. Once you've watched the video, if you do enjoy it, make sure you, you give it a thumbs up, and of course, don't forget, leave us your comments down below as well. Let me know what your thoughts are on the cars that we review, such as the Mercedes-Benz EQS AMG 53, and of course, the Auto EV channel as a whole. Okay. A couple of apologies to make before we get started this week. First of all, there's building work going on behind me at my usual location and I didn't know it was there. So if you're hearing drills and hammers, I'm really, really sorry. I can't do anything about it. The second apology is <clears throat> uh, this. You see, you're watching this a lot later than when I filmed it. And the time I'm filming it, the UK is experiencing oh, some quite hot weather, shall we say. So I've put comfort ahead of vanity and you're going to have to put up with these peely wally legs of mine. So there you go. Right. Let's get started in the road test review. All right, I like Mercedes-Benz cars, always have. And I do like some AMG stuff. I liked a lot of the older cars. During the mid-1980s, they did a car called the Hammer, which was a W124 mid-size saloon with um, a, a six-liter AMG V8 underneath the bonnet. And I thought that was a great looking car. But since they became part of Mercedes-Benz, I have to admit, I've kind of wavered a little bit. I'm not, I find them a bit shouty if I'm honest. And I don't think that is as sort of like as, as pin sharp and as well honed to say BMW's M products. And they do seem to have, dare I suggest, diluted the brand of AMG a little bit, in my opinion. They seem to stick AMG badges on everything. You know, you get a set of big wheels, you put an AMG badge on it. An AMG G-Wagon, what's the point in that? Why are you trying to turn a car that was designed for the German military into some big drag monster? The same with AMG S-Classes, I don't really see the point. A car whose brief, whose design brief, is to be a luxury limousine to sort of like, it cause it you away from all the external stuff, you turn it into this massively powered big drag monster. I don't see the point. But clearly I'm wrong because AMG products are very, very successful, and obviously they're very, very popular within the Mercedes-Benz range. But as I say, how are they going to actually turn their attention to this new electric world? And does electric, and does sort of like AMG-ifying an electric EQS really work? But before we go on with this review, let's take a snapshot of what the EQS AMG 53 is all about. The Mercedes-AMG EQS 53 is the first battery electric AMG production model. 
It's powered by dual motors, producing 658 brake horsepower in standard guise. It has a 108 kilowatt hour battery that can see the EQS AMG 53 travel up to 358 miles between charges according to the WLTP test. And it's priced from £154,995 for this night edition model. Now we know the regular Mercedes-Benz EQS does the whole kind of luxury thing really, really well. But does putting it through the AMG department now add Sporting Pro S to its repertoire? Well, of course, the only way we're going to find out is by putting it through the road test that actual car buyers trust when it comes to choosing their next electric vehicle. And that is the Auto EV one. All right, let's start with styling. Now, AMG products, when it comes to styling, do tend to err on the most kind of subtle side of things. They're not, more, they're not as like, overtly aggressive looking as some external tuning companies um, do. So Mercedes-Benz AMG tend to keep things a little bit more subtle in some respects. But you don't want to be too subtle, especially not with a car like the EQS, because we've always found the styling, whilst inoffensive, it is a little bit bland in fairness. They've gone for the aerodynamics, which is great for efficiency, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't exactly make the car kind of stand out. But the AMG stuff maybe does a little bit in fairness. The grill's different, or oh, where it would be the grill is different here. Rather than a kind of normal black kind of plastic, you've got these kind of vertical kind of chrome strakes, which have mimicked the kind of AMG grills and some of the other models. So that's quite nice. That gives it a little bit of a lift at the front and takes away that big expanse of plastic. Of course, you've still got your big AMG star with a little embedded camera in it and then your Mercedes-Benz badge in the bonnet there. Just a subtle AMG badge on the side there. This lower area is also slightly different. There's a slightly more kind of aggress aggressive kind of look to this area here where these air vents, where they'll take air around and around the side of the car as well. And of course, all your cooling is done down at the below with this slightly more kind of a jutting kind of chin spoiler as well. And it's much the same around the side. Now you do get a couple of different models within um, the, the AMG EQS model. There's a touring model or the night edition. This is the night edition and you can differentiate between the two by the different alloy wheels that they have. These are 21 inch alloy wheels so they're not the biggest tars, wheel and tars you can get in an EQS. A standard car can have 22 inch alloys but these are 21 inch kind of multi-spoke design and they're slightly different to the ones you get on the touring model. Now I have to admit I quite like these. They're, they're sort of like aerodynamically styled enough but giving enough kind of detail and things. And whilst I'm not a big lover of black wheels, as, as most regular viewers will know, the fact they've got that kind of little polished kind of rim round the side as well, just kind of make it stand out a bit. But I do quite like it. And of course, in this white, you've got the kind of contrast between the black and the white, which is actually quite nice. Um, Michelin Pilot Sport uh, tyres um, are standard on the car as well. And there's some AMG sort of like lower kind of cladding. They sort of like the sills are a little bit different to the standard model as well. But again, it's quite subtle in its look. Now, as I say, I've never been the biggest fan of the way the EQS looks. As I say, you can see the shape they've gone for is very aerodynamic, what they call the one bow design. So it literally goes up all the way and arcs back and then drops down into that tailgate there. And it gives the car the lowest drag coefficient of any car out there. It's a CD of 0 0.20. But in doing that, as I say, they've made it look a little bit kind of soap bar bland in my opinion. The other thing that I don't really like is this kind of glass house treatment. There just seems a lot going on. You've got this little bit here and then you've got a little quarter light there, then a bit of trim, then a bit of glass, now and then obviously the B pillar, then another window, then another little window there, then a quarter light at the back. It just seems quite fussy to me. And I think maybe there might have been a better resolution to that, but maybe that's just me. I do find that area quite kind of fussy. The big clamshell bonnet at the front, you can see the kind of shut lines here where that comes down to there and there. That doesn't open. So that doesn't open at all. There's no under bonnet storage. And if, if you've watched our EQS review, you'll know that. You just get this little flap at the side here and that's just for filling up your washer fluid. So that's all that back does there. Of course, you get a Formatic badge there because it's dual motor. Um, so Formatic is Mercedes uh, way of saying it's all wheel drive and your EQS badge there. Door handles, they're nice, they sort of like retract when you, you know, when the car is locked and then when you open the car, they pop out to use and they're illuminated at night, so that's quite nice as well, that's quite a nice, and it's a nice big kind of chunky handle to hold. Now you'll also notice that the doors are frameless as well, so, you know, it's not unique in a four-door saloon, but you don't often see it, and of course there's double glazing around the vehicle as well to keep the noise levels down. We'll talk about the noise levels when we're driving the car. Uh, of course you get little cameras embedded around the car as well to help with the 360 degree parking camera. Um, but yeah, as I say, 
it, 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 it's not as imposing looking as, say, an S-Class, and that's what I've always said about the EQS. And maybe, in some respects, the EQE, um, which seems like an EQS that they've just kind of shrunk by 75%, should look a little bit different. But as I say, they've chased aerodynamics with the cars to aid with efficiency and to help with range, which it does, but the result is it's a little bit bland looking. And as you can see around the back, well, it's the same story, isn't it? You get the little kind of, the boot spoiler that you get on the EQS. Dowager light bar that you would expect. You get AMG badge there, and then your model designation there. Um, lower diffuser area, slightly different as well to help with airflow again, and make it look a little bit more aggressive. And of course, your, your boot badge, your three-pointed star, also doubles up as your reverse camera and your boot release. So, as I say, it depends on your viewpoint how you're going to find the styling of the EQS AMG. It's very subtle because, as I say, in some respects, AMG tends to be the more subtle of all the kind of high-performance Merc tuners, if you'll pardon that expression, because they are part of Mercedes-Benz now. But maybe it's a little bit too subtle, and on a car that's, dare I suggest, quite bland-looking in styling to begin with, should they have gone a little bit further with it? But that's my opinion. What's yours? As always, let me know in the comments down below. Now, in terms of practicality, the EQS offers 620 litres of boot space. And as you can see, it is a lift-back saloon. Um, so like the Tesla Model S Plaid that we had uh, the other week, it gives you this that extra bit of practicality by having a hatchback. Whereas the BMW i7, probably the car's main rival, um, has a boot on it. So it's a three-box saloon, and that only has... 500 litres, so big difference. 620 litres, as you can see, does swallow the four auto EV suitcases plus my camera bag, plus bags of space to spare. So if you were going away on holiday and you were maybe saying, I don't know, taking a set of golf clubs, I don't play golf, I'm afraid, so um, I don't really know, but I would imagine a set of clubs would also fit in there, or you'd get maybe four sets, um, uh, you know, sort of like lengthways instead of four suitcases. So there's enough practicality for you. You can extend it, however, because you can extend it by folding down the rear seats, and the rear seats fold in a 40-20-40 split, so you've got a little bit of a load through. Now, there is some underfloor storage in the car as well, um, so that's not too bad, though it doesn't take all of the cables because it's quite a small bit of storage, so there is actually a separate cable bag uh, down the side of this car here as well, so that's fine. But it's not enough to sort of like um, Im impede into what is a massive boot for this size of car. All right. <clears throat> Well, in the back, it's pretty much as we've seen before with the EQS. It is a big car back here, there's no doubt about it. And of course the car sits on a bespoke EV platform, so there is no intrusion really. There's a small centre tunnel here, but nothing that would cause any discomfort to a middle passenger. Um, the only thing I will say is, whilst there is a lot of space back here, and whilst it is very, very comfortable, it's sort of lacking the sort of like... I don't know, the, the toys that you can have with the BMW i7. You can have a rear entertainment package with the car, which would give you some screens here, but that's kind of it. There isn't the big drama, the big theatre package that BMW seems to have. And whilst the seats are very, very comfortable, they don't really move any, so you're kind of just kind of sitting here like this. To say it's plenty of space, and the, you know, the seats themselves are fine, but I wouldn't say it feels as special, especially when we talk about the price of this car. But then maybe I'm getting it a little bit wrong. Maybe, of course, with it being the AMG model, it's designed more for the person that sat there than the person that sat there, sat here, sorry. Anyway, uh, what do you get? Well, of course, you get rear climate control system down here. Um, you, if you fold it down, there's also two USB-C ports in there. So that's fine. There's some of these kind of rigid airline style map pockets in the backs of the seats for storage and you get this fold down armrest as well which has um storage uh, sorry cup holders there um but that's really it you know the door bins are fine door bins are all right they won't really take a massive big water bottle but they certainly take a slightly small child's one and talking to children you do get access easy access to the ice fix via these kind of plastic covers so that's easy enough to get in but they kind of protrude a little bit and they're catching me just just at the base of my spine there so as I say it doesn't feel as kind of luxurious and you want to kind of just 
sit back and lounge. I like the fact they've got these nice kind of soft pillows attached to the head restraints, but that's it. It doesn't feel particularly special, especially as I say, given the price of the car. Now, you do get this big double sunroof here. So you've got the fixed pane at the back and then you've got an opening pane at the front uh, with just this kind of center bar. And of course, you've got your kind of lights around it. And you get some very nice ambient lighting and an excellent Burmeister uh, stereo system fitted to the car as well. And then you've got this kind of gloss carbon fiber just to kind of lift sort of like, you know, the, the back, in the back of the car. So there does, although it's a, a dark cabin, it does let a lot of light through. But obviously, as I say, depending obviously on your height, you see that roof is starting to just kind of slope back a little bit there. Most people should be all right, but I'd suggest if you're well over six foot, you are going to find this a little bit tight in the back. But as I say, there's nothing wrong with its accommodation and its relative comfort. It just doesn't feel as special as maybe I think it should do. Well, there isn't really any difference to um, the AMG model of EQS and there is the standard car other than trim. But I'll go through bits of it with you in case you haven't seen our original uh, road test review of the EQS. Um, one thing you do get, you get the hyper screen is standard, um, which is 56 inch screens. Now it, it looks all quite intimidating when you first jump in the car uh, in fairness, but actually when you realise that it's just three separate screens under one piece of glass, it, it doesn't seem quite as complicated maybe as you first think. Um, and the third screen, the one in front of the passenger, doesn't actually activate unless someone's sitting in the screen. Uh, sorry, sitting in the seat, so that's not really a problem. So let's just quickly go through it. You've got your driver binnacle here. Um, which is very, very nice and very, nice and easy to use. Uh, I really do like it um, and it's nice and easy to control. You can change um, as, as you normally can, you know, with, with Mercedes-Benz, you can change um, to see what you particularly want. So if you want a duplication of your navigation up there, um, um, you want to have uh, an understated type of dials, um, you can have those. Um, or if you want the classic ones, or Super Sport they do now. Wow, look at that. Super Sport looks like a spaceship's cockpit. Probably, I don't know. Um, I'll just stick with the classic ones, thank you very much. So yeah, so nice and easy to use, and as I say, very configurable. You get everything you need. You get your speed on the left, you get your power output on the right, you can see your state of charge, your miles to go down there. What's really interesting with Mercedes, and I really do like this on the EQ products, it predicts a minimum amount of range and a maximum amount of range. Um, so depending obviously on your driving style, it monitors it. And I'll talk about it in the usability section, but the efficiency and the, the range I've been getting out of this car has been excellent, I have to admit. So that's very, very good. The main event, obviously, however, is this section here, um, which is this. Now, you get wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as standard. And obviously, a lot of people just do that. And, I, and um, they use Waze or they use Google Maps or Apple Maps, whatever. You're missing out on the Mercedes-Benz navigation if you do that, because this is a simply staggering system. I absolutely love the level of detail that you get in this system. I was playing with it when I was in a traffic jam um, earlier today, and I think this is absolutely superb this system. So if we kind of go into zoom in on London, for instance, I mean, look at the quality of this, you know, there's all the buildings in London popping up, you know, there's Canary Wharf, um, you know, Cabot Place, um, you, you know, you go across, it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. I love this system. Look, there's the O2, you know, you just don't get that on sort of like other cars, even Tesla. Knocks the BMW's um, user interface out of the park, I think. I think this is a phenomenally good system and it's really quick to respond. Look, look at that. There's the Gherkin walkie talkie building, the Shard. Phenomenal. So yeah, the the, the, the navigation is, is, is exceptional on Mercedes-Benz. But as I say, you do get wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Now, there's a lot in here. There's a lot to, to, to go through. Um, but what's in the screen, oddly enough, you don't need to worry too much about. So if you bring up the car settings, for instance, a lot of this is stuff you will... Um, activate when you first get it and then never need to go into it again so things like 
folding door mirrors when you lock the car, how long you want the follow you home lights to stay on, that type of thing. Um, you know, and you just go through it and it's very, very easy to find. It's all the way through there. Your driving assistance, that might be the one you change a couple of times, but again, it's nice and easy to find. You know, if you want active steering assist, active lane change assist, collision avoidance, your, your parking camera and so forth, it's all in there. But once you set it up, you can save it all and that's it. Things you need at the touch of a button, so for instance, climate control, that's permanently on. Um, so you can see the basics ones here. So you've got fan speed and temperature here and whether you want throughput of air, auto climate, heated rear screen and maximum defrost. So although it's on the screen, it's permanently there. If you want a more precise menu for your climate, you just press the climate menu and it brings it up here where you can choose where you want the airflow, the air quality and pre-entry climate control. So in other words, you want to set it up to start before you set off on a journey, you can do that in there. But otherwise, it's all just down there and it's permanently there. And it's the same with all the other things that you might need on the car. So the drive modes, for instance, can be selected either through this AMG button here and it brings it up on the screen or you can do it via these little dials on the steering wheel as well. So again, there's physical buttons that you can use. And I'll talk about these when we're, when we're driving the car because you know, you know, they have different functionality. You can set up Sport, Sport Plus, Comfort, Suspension. You can turn your, your, your handling mode on or off from here, your traction control system. You can talk about you know, your AMG dynamics, the noise that it makes. And again, as well as having the preset modes, so Comfort, Sport and Sport Plus, you can set up an individual one for your preferences. So if you want the drive, uh, the, the throttle mapping to be dynamic, but um, the sound to be the sportier, the powerful sound, but you want the comfort suspension, you can program that into this I mode here and then just select it either through the screen or on the steering wheel. So don't have a problem with that whatsoever. I think that's quite good. Same with things like, you know, parking assist cameras. You know, you just press a button there. You don't have to delve into a screen. Charging information, there's a button there. Your actual settings menu for the car. So things like, you know, your head-up display, which it has, that's on a button. Fingerprint uh, recognition is there. So again, it would recognise all your settings if you set that up through the Mercedes Me app. Um, on and off for your media of, uh, mute and then your volume select uh, control is there. As well as that... You've also got this slightly redesigned steering wheel from the first car that I drove with these kind of twin spokes. Now they do have touch sensitive buttons. They do have touch sensitive, but unlike Volkswagen, these work. They're really good. I like them. They're all right on this. So your media controls, your telephone controls are on the, on the left side. Your cruise controls are all on the right hand side. And they're as slick to use as you can imagine they would be from somebody like Mercedes Benz. They're also mounted far enough into the wheel that you don't tend to hit them with the heel of your hand like you do on the Volkswagen. So that's good. Uh, column stocks. Yes. Look at this Tesla. Um, you've got indicator and wiper on one column stock and your drive mode selector over there. Um, up for reverse, down for drive, push in for park. Innovative there, Tesla. And look, to get your indicators on, you do this. And that stays where it is. Isn't that funny? Look, it stays exactly where it is. See, even if you've got the wheel turned, you know where your indicators are. Come on, Elon. Um, right. Storage, excellent as well. Coffee cup, water flask. Um, two cup holders in there. There's also a wireless charging pad down in there and there's also a little cubby there which will take sunglasses, my wallet. If you want that covered, you just do it and it covers it up. So that's good. Underneath there, there is a large storage tray as well which is big enough for say a handbag or a folio case um, or a laptop or a, an iPad, that can go down there. Um, you've also got this centre cubby here. Um, where you can actually plug your phone in if you want to, though I don't know why you would, but there we are, that's done. And there's door bins, which are good as well. They'll not take a massive water bottle, but they'll take a slightly stubbier one, uh, and there's enough. And they're kind of soft, they're lined with soft rubber as well, which is good, so things don't tend to rattle in them, which I do like. Talking of the materials, um, it's all right, there's a kind of mixture of things in here, as you can probably see. You've got this Alcantara, this black Alcantara. Um, on the sort of like centre console and a bit of the door and then the, the sort of like the, the, the nine o'clock and three o'clock sector of the steering wheel which is nice to hold but then you've got this kind of grey neoprene which is running around the top of the cabin as well and then you've got the black leather of the seats 
um, and the glossy carbon fibre. So there is a lot of materials kind of going on in the car. Um, it doesn't look too bad. I'm not convinced it's my kind of cup of tea if I'm if I'm being straight with you. I think that's why I quite like the kind of luxury side of the EQS. Maybe it's my age, I don't know. I think there's a lot of materials kind of against each other. It does work. I'm just not sure it's it's my kind of cup of chai, but there we go. Uh, driving position. Well, the driving position is excellent. You get these really nice seats. Um, they're electrically adjustable. You can also um, electrically adjust the length of the squab as well, which is nice. It kind of rolls out underneath your thigh, which is really nice and supportive. Heated seats, ventilated seats um, are standard as well. Um, you get heated rear seats and, and the AMG as well, and you get a three position memory. Your head restraints manually move, so you can have them in or out, which is good, and they are nice and comfortable, so they get you just where you want them to be. Uh, and the steering column is electrically adjustable as well. And so you do tend to find you will get a really nice driving position with the car. That's excellent. So on the whole, summary, good cabin. This is great. I like this. This is very easy to use. Oh, I didn't mention the other thing. You can control it with voice activation as well. The MBUX system has got one of the best voice activations that I've used in a car. Um, so that's another thing. You can just say, hey, mm -hmm, um, navigate me to wherever, uh, and it'll do it. Or, hey, mm, switch on, you know, or open sunroof or whatever, and it will do that. So that's excellent too. Yeah, so as I say, summary, um, yeah, I got on well with it. I like the hyper screen. I think it looks good. I think the navigation is better than you get in, say, the BMW. Um, I think, uh, it's, in some respects, it is even better than the Tesla Model S. And I do like the Tesla um, screen, but I think the quality um, and, and the usability of this just edges it, I would suggest, certainly when you're using the navigation. Uh, build quality is good. I'm not 100% convinced of the kind of mixture of materials in here. Some people will like it. I'll put that down to a personal preference um, where I'm not quite 100% with it, but it does feel quite special. It does feel different to sort of like other cars. Um, but as I say, I'd probably want something that looks a bit more, or feels certainly a bit more luxurious at this price point. Um, but in terms of the rest of the carbon, I think it's a really good effort. I think it's one of Mercedes-Benz best. So of course with the EQS you get a massive 107 kilowatt hour battery, which should give, according to WLTP figures on the AMG model, a range of up to 347 miles. What I will say is this, I think this car is really efficient and I was talking about the aerodynamics in the styling section earlier and it really does help the car because even the EV um, database predicts a real world range of around about 325 miles and the way I've been driving this car and using it over the last few days, I've been down at the Goodwood Revival which is sort of like, you know, it's like a, a round trip of about 120 miles from my house um, and it pretty much did. It lost 120 miles on that route, which was a mixture of motorways and uh, sort of like back roads where I was, you know, giving it some relative beans. So I think this is a very, very good car in terms of its efficiency. Charging speeds. Well, it'll charge up to 200 kilowatts, um, meaning you can go from your benchmark 10 to 80 percent and run about 28 minutes. If you're charging it up from full, now bear in mind the size of the battery, from your seven kilowatt wall box, you're looking at 15 to 16 hours. Um, but if you do have a more powerful 11 kilowatt wall box, so three phase electricity, you can bring that time down to 10 hours because it has an onboard 11 kilowatt charger. The other thing the EQS um, AMG has is it has a heat pump as standard as well. So that will also help with range and efficiency. Now, I want to talk about power because um, the, the AMG 53 comes in two guises. You have the Touring or you have this Night Edition car, as I say. And the standard cars have 658 horsepower, which will see them sprint from 0 to 62 miles an hour in 3.8 seconds, which, as I say, you know... Uh, if you have been a regular viewer of Auto EV, you'll know how many of these performance EVs I've been driving of late. That's quick, especially in a car that weighs, you know, 2.7 tonnes. However, this car has the AMG Performance Pack fitted, which takes the power to 761 horsepower. And torque goes up to just over 1,000 newton metres. Now this will do the 0 to 60 sprint in under three and a half seconds. So not quite as quick as the Tesla Model S Plaid, admittedly, but plenty fast enough, in fairness. The thing that gets me about all of this, however, 
is how still quiet and refined it all is. Now, obviously, it's an EQS, so it's going to be quiet and refined. Um, you know, it is one of those cars that I think just absolutely ticks all the boxes when it comes to luxury travel. You know, you don't get a particularly... Um, you know, you get huge amounts of wind noise, you don't get, you know, like a lot of road noise from the car. Mercedes-Benz... Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a blind spot, sorry. Um, you don't get... So Mercedes-Benz have done noise cancelling in the EQS, so, you know, they've worked really, really hard. So as you're driving along, so the speakers admit a, 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 like a cancelling frequency to, to cancel it all the other sort of like, you know sort of like noises that are coming into the car and it works so well but and bear with me on this because I'm going to talk about engines at the moment because isn't that part of what AMG were really about is the noise isn't it really about the sort of like it's not just sort of like the you know sort of like the handling and the performance from a, a chassis point of view but they built a company based upon sort of like engines and speed and power and the noise is part of that so this kind of comes down to what I was saying I'm not really sure about whether we need these sort of performance orientated um, electric AMGs and M card I'm genuinely not sure because I think the standard car the standard EQS does everything so well why, why go and sort of like muck that up by trying to make it into a performance car? However, let's carry on talking. Right, you get different drive modes with the AMG as well. As I said to you earlier, you can control them either through the screen, this button here, or this drive select on the steering wheel. Now, if I go into Sport, what it's done now is it's it's got a slightly sharper throttle response you see and you've got slightly stiffened up suspension and you get that sporty noise that they make the car's noises i have to say i really do like it's one of the things i do like about it when you shut it down and you walk away from it and you lock it it does this kind of star wars kind of kind of noise that you know as if to say everyone's just shutting down now and um you, you know it's like a, a computer or a spaceship shutting down i think that's really fun and i do like that anyway i'm going off track you get the kind of sporty noise with in the sport mode then you go to sport plus <laughs> you get the maximum throttle response. The, the suspension's now and it's like it's hardest setting. And when I say it's hardest setting, it's not uncomfortable at all. It's still a very, very good sort of suspension setup. Don't get me wrong, you can feel a lot more. Um, but what it does is it really tightens the car up. It, it makes it, re you can really tell the difference. Having come from the Tesla Model Ed S Plaid last week and into then this car, um, you can really feel the difference in the chassis dynamics because where's the Tesla, as you sort of like pushed a little bit further, it started to get a bit out of shape, it, it started to kind of stumble on itself a little bit, almost to the point you had to dial the power back, the speed back. The EQS MG doesn't do that. It kind of, it, it, it works with you and you can really feel the car just working in the corners as you go into a bend you know it stays really flat it doesn't feel like it's tipping over it does disguise its weight and its bulk quite well i'm not going to suggest it shrinks around you like a little caterham or a lotus elise it doesn't do that but as i say it just seems to get really really on with the job so as i say as much as i sort of like i'm questioning why you'd have a performance version of this car the fact that it is as good as it is speaks volumes about how far AMG have gone to make it as good as it is. I want to get this across. I am not in any sense saying that this is a bad car at all. It's not. It's an exceptionally good car. I'm questioning whether or not you would just buy a standard EQS and whether or not you need the AMG models. That's the bit. Excuse me, I'm just about to go through a really tight width restriction here. Uh, there we go, there's your camera's goal going off and beepers, lovely, right. Steering, steering's really interesting because the EQS has a rear wheel steer system on it and this really does impress because this is a big old Herbert of a car um, and you can really get it manoeuvred uh, in some tight spaces. I really do like the steering, that count, it counter steers at low speed um, to allow maximum manoeuvrability 
in tight spaces and as I say, it really makes the car turn in a really tight way. At higher speeds, it, it, it moves, the ste it steers in the same direction to allow for better stability. Works superb, it really does work superb. I'm sorry, I'm gonna come out of the sport mode there. Hang on, I'll get back to comfort, there we are. Um, so yeah, the steering is absolutely excellent, I have to say. Kudos there, it's one of the, it really, really, that rear wheel steering really works. Now the brakes, the brakes were a point of contention, a bone of contention for me in the original EQS that were very, very vague and I've since spoken to a lot of journalists who said exactly the same as me, they felt the brakes just were not up to the job. The performance pack, the AMG performance pack adds on carbon ceramics uh, and this transforms the brakes on the EQS. It's got really good stopping power on this car as you'd expect with carbon ceramics on it but of course you've got to pay the extra to get them. Now you've got brake regeneration with it you've got kind of three levels and um, which are activated via the paddles behind the steering wheel which i always think is the best way you get normal recuperation you get strong recuperation or you can take the whole thing off no recuperation so if you're on the motorway or an open a road you just let it coast and it's being it's most efficient or you put on normal or strong You've also got a further one where it's an adaptive recuperation and again we've spoken about it before a lot of cars do have this so it's using the GPS, it's using the cameras so it knows if you're coming up to a junction or maybe a roundabout or there's a car really slowing down in front of you and it'll start to apply the brakes on its own and adjust the recuperation. It's a very very good system, I do like it, I like the way you can adjust it and I think it works really really well. The ride quality um, from the dampers through the different modes it is very good. You can really tell the difference between each mode and as I say, even in Sport Plus, it's not an uncomfortable car. It doesn't get too jiggly. But I've set up my individual mode on this. Um, so what I've got is the sport, the, the, the maximum kind of throttle response, um, the kind of sport sound, but the comfort suspension. Um, and I think that's a really nice blend. It doesn't wallow. It doesn't make it feel like a like a like a you know like a great big freighter in a squall. It still has an element of body control in it, but it just isolates you a little bit more from the road surface. Yeah, you do. You'll hear that pitter patter when getting across the expansion joints. But see, remember, there's you know 21 inch alloys with some big old Michelin tires on this car, so there will be an element of noise you do get from it. But on the whole, as I say, this is a very, very impressive car and I really, really do like it a lot. But like I've said on a lot of my other performance EV reviews, I like the car, the standard car that it's based on anyway. So I'm questioning, as I say, whether or not that's the bits of it that I really do like and whether or not those extra elements that the AMG part brings to it. I don't need 761 brake horsepower in a luxury limousine. I genuinely don't. I don't need that level of power. It's nice to have every now and again, but as I say, driving it up and down to Goodwood the other day, you know, you're sitting at 50 miles an hour in a queue of traffic. What good is 760 horsepower to you? I'd rather save the money. The Scotsman in me would rather save the money and just buy a standard EQS 580. Now, as you can imagine, this is not an inexpensive car, but even I was quite taken aback by the price of this one. So an EQS AMG 53 Night Edition, like this car, is £161,860. But this car, as tested, is over £170,000 because it has the AMG Performance Pack which adds on another 8995 Now you get more power with that and obviously you get these excellent, as I said before, these carbon ceramic brakes as well. That is a chunky bit of change, I would suggest. Now, the car comes in terms of its warranty, sorry, it's just locked itself. The car comes warranty-wise with the standard three-year warranty from Mercedes-Benz, which I think is a bit stingy in some respects, especially now we're seeing cars way cheaper than this with seven eight year warranties and such like even lexus offer up to 10 years warranty on their cars now but of course in terms of its battery you get the standard eight years hundred thousand miles which seems to be the industry norm against its battery but yeah you're gonna have to dig deep if you want one of these 
Now, in terms of competition, your main rival is going to be, well, it's the old firm rivals, isn't it? Mercedes-Benz and BMW. It's the BMW i7 M70. They're kind of performance-orientated version of the i7. And that's a car I'm going to be testing very, very soon as well. So make sure you stay tuned for that one. So that's going to be its main rival. You can't really ignore as well the Tesla Model S Plaid that we, we had on the show a few weeks back as well, because in terms of outright power and data suggest pound per performance, it slays this car. The only downside with the Tesla is that in some respects, it does feel like a slightly cheaper car as it should be. So away from that performance, you know, the engineering doesn't feel quite as good. The build quality is not is quite as nice. And some of the tech, while it's very, very good, don't get me wrong, it is very good Tesla because that is their main focus, doesn't feel maybe quite as kind of slick and easy to use maybe as the Mercedes-Benz or the BMW system. If you're going for a more kind of sporting kind of nature, then maybe you're going to consider things like the Porsche Taycan Turbo S and of course the Audi e-tron GT RS as well. The other car we mentioned when we were testing the Tesla, of course, um, especially if you're now in Europe, is the Lucid Air. Um, again, it's like a big luxury car with a huge amount of power, uh, a lot of technology on it, but of course it's from a relatively unknown manufacturer. That's maybe the only really downside with the Lucid Air. And of course we're not getting it in the UK at the moment, so we can't really bring you a road test of it. Now, there was um, a rumour in the press just not so long since ago that Jaguar are going to re-enter this market. Now, I've spoken a lot about Jaguar and did I suggest my disappointment at them in canning the all-electric XJ that we were supposed to be having by now. But if this rumour is to be believed that the cars that Jaguar are coming back with, whilst the first couple of them are going to be SUVs of some description, there is also a sort of indirect replacement for that XJ. They are working on, I'm led to believe, a big three box luxury saloon car and because Jaguar are moving themselves or want to move themselves up market in terms of its price point it's probably going to be in excess of £150,000 so if that rumour is to be believed we could also see Jaguar re-enter the marketplace with a rival for this. So the Mercedes-Benz EQS AMG 53 here's what we like and what we don't like about this car. Well we like its comfort and its refinement. It's quite spacious the interior design and technology is very easy to use and its range and efficiency is also very good. And in fairness, its dynamics do live up to the AMG billing. We don't like. Well, the styling's still just a little bit too bland for us, even in AMG form. The extra cost of that AMG performance pack and therefore the overall price of the car and in our opinion, it doesn't feel as special in the rear as the BMW i7. So the Mercedes-Benz EQS AMG 53, what do I make of it? Well, I've always liked the EQS. I know it's a car that divides a lot of opinion, certainly in the motoring press. Some of us like it, some of us don't. I happen to like it. I think it's a good car. I said that right at the time. I thought it was a real game changer in terms of the luxury motoring side of things. But I also did say back then that the then to be launched BMW i7 would have to be something special to be better than it. And of course, I've tested the i7 since, and I think it is better than the standard EQS. I think that's a real special car. But that's not really what we're discussing. We're discussing the AMG model. Does it justify the AMG kind of badge, the feckling that they've done. Well, it is an interesting car. You see, I think it's a I think it's a better car than say the Tesla Model S Plaid. I think it uses its power better. I mean obviously it's not as quick as that car. But I think the Tesla, as I said, as much as I like it, I think it's very much the kind of traffic like Grand Prix King. Once you get it away from that, it, it, it struggles to kind of find where it needs to be. Whereas this doesn't, as I say, there's a bit more dynamics um, in it, there's a bit more engineering and you can feel it that's gone into it. But that's not to say that I think that it's a car that I would necessarily buy. You see, this is where I'm kind of struggling a bit with these performance orientated limousines or luxury cars, if you will. You see, manufacturers like Mercedes-Benz and BMW take a car like the EQS and develop it to cause it you to 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 like to to had to take all away all the stress and the strains and also like make everything nice and comfortable and quiet and sort of like you know make you feel a bit more relaxed. 
So what's the point then to sort of like then add in a bit more sort of like dynamics to it to make you feel a bit more on edge and you've got to control it? I just basically don't really see the point because if you want a car like that, why wouldn't you be buying something like a Porsche Taycan Turbo S or a, an Audi e-tron GT RS? So whilst I like the EQS, I'm kind of struggling to justify the AMG one, certainly at this price point. At over £170,000, as good as it is, the Scotsman in me would be spending a lot less and plumping for a standard EQS and leaving the AMG one to the side. Thank you for watching yet another road test review um, from us here at Auto EV. Please remember, make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Then once you've done that, press the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video is uploaded and goes live. If you've enjoyed the video, please make sure you give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave me your comments down below. What do you think of the fact that AMG do a fast version of the EQS? Do you think it's justified? Have you got one? Do you like it? What made you choose it? As always, let us know in the comments down below. And now remember, we're also across all other social media platforms as well. So Facebook, X, uh, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, TikTok. So please give us a follow there as well, because that does help us too. And if this has just kind of whetted your appetite for even more electric car reviews, then stick on the YouTube channel, because there's, there's nearly 160 videos now. And they're not just road test reviews. There's sneak peeks. There's electric icon series. Um, there's uh, twin tests. There's used car buying advice. There's some van reviews on there. There's even a couple of motorbike reviews on there as well so stick on the channel and waste away your afternoon watching some videos there and now i do need to say thank you thank you very much for putting up with the external sort of building what's going on thank you for putting up with my beautiful mediterranean complexion as always and but most of all thank you for watching thank you thank you thank you for supporting the channel and i'll see you again soon